last week on In Pit Lane, we showed you the beautiful and inspiring city of Paris. So it's only fair that this week we show you London. This is London. Thank you. Thank God for Goodwood. Run on the estate of Lord March, just across from the racetrack, the Goodwood Festival began as a small-scale enthusiast get-together, and has since grown to become one of the most important events on the European motorsport calendar. An indication of that importance is the presence of several of the top Formula One teams, who take time out of their hectic race schedule to perform at the festival. BAR Honda had its 005 chassis on hand for Jensen Button and Takuma Sato. Williams BMW brought out last year's FW25 for test driver Antonio Pizzonia, who delighted the crowd with the weekend's best burnouts. Olivier Panis and Ricardo Zonta were on board the Toyota TF103. Renault was represented by its test driver, Frank Montagni, in their R23 chassis, while McLaren Mercedes had an MP4 17D for its testing pair of Alexander Wurtz and Pedro Diniz. Of course, the highlight of any Formula One gathering is always the presence of Ferrari, and the Tafosi had plenty to look at at Goodwood. The factory had the F2002 that dominated two years of Formula One racing in the hands of Michael Schumacher. It was driven here by test driver Luca Badoa. Also on hand, an F2001 and the older F399. Only at Goodwood can you get this close to a state-of-the-art Formula One machine, and the first thing you notice is attention to detail. Every winglet and barge board, some as small as a postcard, is there for a reason. In Formula One, every little bit counts and nothing is left to chance. To see just how far the sport has progressed in such a relatively short period of time, you have to look at some of the older Formula One machines on show at Goodwood. The FW07 that took Alan Jones to his world title looks positively agricultural now. The 3-litre Codsworth DFV engine is, however, still a thing of rare beauty. Also on hand was the FW08, as driven by Keki Rosberg and Ricardo Patrese. A car that revolutionised Formula One, the Renault RS01, the first of the Turbo Era cars. Honda bought out their unusual R8272 with its screaming 1.5-litre V12 transverse mounted engine. Ken Tyrrell holds a special place in the hearts of English race fans, a privateer who took on the might of the factory teams and won. Here at Goodwood was the 006 model that gave Jackie Stewart the last of his three world championships. The 008 was a neat but conventional car that was never in the hunt against the radical new ground effects cars of Lotus in the late 1970s. Despite this, Patrick de Pellier took the car to two unlikely victories. When the 019 model arrived, people everywhere were aghast at its unusual high nose design. Today, it's still a feature of all major open wheel categories. The French Ligier team had its GS11 at Goodwood. Driven by Jacques Lafitte, the Ligier was an unlikely contender for outright honours in 1980. One of McLaren's most successful cars, the MP42C. Powered by a Porsche designed TAG 1.5 litre turbo, this car was driven to several major race wins by Elaine Prost. The M23 McLaren pioneered the use of composite fibre technology and took both Emerson Fittipaldi and the late James Hunt to world titles. This year's Goodwood paid special tribute to the great Ayrton Senna. One of the weekend's most emotional moments was when his good friend, IndyCar star, Gilles de Ferran drove Senna's McLaren Ford MP4-8. Another ex-Senna Grand Prix car, this 
is the JPS Lotus 97T. The T denotes the use of the Renault turbo engine. This is the car that gave Senna his first ever Grand Prix win in the wet at Portugal in 1985. A Ferrari of a different vintage, the V8 powered 158, driven here as in the past by the great John Surtees. This is the last of the truly competitive front-engine Grand Prix cars, the magnificent Ferrari 246. Alfa Romeo was one of the great marks in Grand Prix and sports car racing from the mid-20th century. One of its most successful cars was this Tipo or Type B. With its 2.9 litre supercharged 8 cylinder motor, the Type B was one of the world's top race cars in the early 1930s. The smaller 8C Monza also saw a great deal of success in the 30s and, due to its French heritage in this case, it's actually not red. Lancia produced a number of classic sports and race cars throughout the 1940s and 50s. This D50A was one of the few cars of the time that could match the might of the dominant Mercedes. With its wide angle compact V8 engine and its side mounted fuel tanks, the Lancia made up in handling for anything lost in power. But of course the car to beat was Mercedes. The W154 was powered by a 3-litre supercharged straight 8 and dominated the 1939 Grand Prix season. Its great victory is overshadowed by its use as a propaganda tool by the Nazis. Following the war, Mercedes made a surprise return to racing with the W196. Smaller and lighter than the 154, it was powered by a 2.5 litre engine and gave one Manuel Fangio back-to-back -back world titles. A world away from the Grand Prix tracks of Europe, Australian motorsport was developing at its own pace. This car, the Maybach Mark I, was raced by Stan Jones and shocked the motorsport world by taking on and regularly beating the European thoroughbreds. Stan's son Alan was at Goodwood to drive his father's car, which attracted enormous curiosity from an interested European enthusiast crowd. No Goodwood Festival would be complete without Sir Jack. And he was here, along with this Offenhauser-powered Brabham that raced at Indy in 1964. Brabham revolutionised Indy when in 1963 he raced his tiny rear-engine Cooper against the monstrous front-engine Roadsters. Cars like this. The 4-litre Offenhauser-powered Bellinger Special. Built originally as a dirt track racer, the car won the 1951 Indy 500 in the hands of Lee Wallard. It was later driven by Tony Bettenhausen, and his son Gary was behind the wheel here. Somehow, I don't think it ever looked quite this good in its racing days. By the late 1960s, the rear-engined revolution had taken hold at Indy, and the race was now being dominated by English-built chassis like this Lola T-153 of Mark Donoghue. Surprisingly, some of the most advanced automotive design on track at Goodwood was from the slowest and quietest cars present. The Dunhill Challenge was created several years ago as a diversion from the main event. Since then, the downhill race has attracted some of the biggest names in motorsport design and construction. 
Williams, Cadillac and others have all taken the challenge. This year, Visteron had this device entered called the Velocity. Lotus was there with their Type 119C. Ford's rather uninspiring effort was called the RS Box, for good reason. This is the Quinto Carula 20, and this car came from GTG Talkline. The Porsche Club of Great Britain also got into the act with their Speedster 2. There was even a car from Bentley, the XP9.83. Off the track there was plenty to see, plenty to do, and somehow, well, you just lose yourself in the spirit of it all. I did it at Le Mans, so you should do it here. In fact, everybody's doing it this summer. Yes. It's absolutely lovely. We're here. Look, at, look, I've just had a lovely glass of Australian red wine. It's actually quite good. It's, it's really quite good indeed. And we're having a lovely time here at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. It's not as good as the revival meeting, I'd like to believe. The revival meeting is very elegant. This is a, a touch common. They're allowing Brian Ferry in. Brian Ferry is here at the moment. He's a lovely chap. But he's just a touch common. He's not Rowan Atkinson. So anyway, you have a lovely anyway, you have a lovely day. We'll see you a bit later on. We'll go to a break right now. You can watch some Australian type uh, television advertisements, I think they call them. And after the break, we shall be back with more exciting action from what is called the Goodwood Festival of Speed. I shall get a recharge on my glass. Tally ho. Welcome back to the Goodwood Festival of Speed. Sports cars are a major part of any historic gathering and the field at Goodwood was a who's who of international sports car competition. One of the most popular cars at Goodwood was the Bentley Speed 8 that won the 2003 Le Mans 24 hours. Powered by a 4 litre turbocharged Audi engine, the Bentley ran at Le Mans just once and was immediately retired. Quite a waste really when you think of it. One of the most successful endurance cars of all time, the Porsche 956. This car dominated Group C racing in the 1980s and its domination eventually killed the category. BMW had this March GTP at the festival. The car was designed and built for the IMSA series in the United States, but reliability problems with its turbocharged four-cylinder engine restricted the car to only one win. The factory had somewhat more luck with the F1, a collaboration with McLaren that was all but unbeatable in the mid-1980s, winning at Le Mans at its first attempt. Renault's Alpine A44B gave the French manufacturer its only ever win at Le Mans in 1978. The V6 turbo engine gave the factory the inspiration to produce the 1.5 litre version for Formula One competition thus heralding the new era of turbocharging in Grand Prix racing. Ford came to Le Mans in 1965 with the magnificent GT40. There's plenty of replicas around today, including one in the Victorian State Series. In fact, Ford themselves are building them. But these are the fair income genuine article. The white car seen here is owned and raced by McLaren designer Adrian Newey. Is this the ultimate sports car? Certainly it's probably the most famous. The Porsche 917K became famous all around the world for its dominant race performances and its starring role in the Steve McQueen movie Le Mans. This car was in fact damaged during the filming of the movie and since being rebuilt competes regularly at events like Goodwood. There was also a special long tail derivation of the car, especially for the long Mulsanne straight at Le Mans. Dubbed Moby Dick, this psychedelic wonder finished second at Le Mans in 1970.
The ultimate version of the 917 was this awesome 1500 brake horsepower version for the K&M series and driven here with great joy by Derek Bell. The North American K&M series produced some of the most powerful and innovative race cars ever built. One of the greats was Chaparral. This is the first of the White Lightning specials built in 1961. American Jim Hall was a constant innovator and his later cars pioneered ideas such as wings, turbocharging and ground effects decades before Formula One. Believe it or not, this pretty American sports car is called the Echidna. Powered by a 5.5 litre Chev V8, the car was named after the Australian anteater because of its long nose. There were plenty of touring cars at Goodwood, a constant procession of some of the most famous cars ever to grace a racetrack. There were cars from the British Touring Car Championship. The German Touring Car Championship, the Trans Am and, uh, hang on, what, no VA supercars? So, somebody call Tony, this is an outrage. This is probably my favourite touring car of all time, the Capri RS 3100. Powered by a Cosworth developed V6 putting out close to 500 horsepower, the Capri was Ford's major weapon in the European Touring Car Championships of the early 1970s. It even did some time here in Australia as a sports sedan for Alan Moffat. Driven by some of the world's best drivers, including Nicky Lauda and Jochen Mass, the car dominated the 1973 European title. But then, in 1974, a change of regulation saw BMW debut the ultimate touring car, the 3.5 litre straight six CSL. Dubbed the Batmobile because of its massive wings, it totally dominated racing until the early 80s and more or less killed the category stone dead. NASCAR was represented by this galaxy from the famous race team of Holman and Moody, but of course the real highlight was Yes, the car behind the man, behind the myth, behind the legend that lies within the mystique of the extraordinarily gifted Mr. Geoffrey Gordon. Long queues of desperate Britons lined up around the clock to lay their hands upon the Rainbow Warrior and thus feel its awesome healing powers. Clearly, as you can hear in my fading voice, I wasn't one of them. The state of the art in American touring car racing was represented by this Cadillac CTS, built and maintained by Bill DeLong. Well, this car, it's a, uh, it's a very important car to GM, the CTS. They've uh, come out with the CTS-V, which has an eight-cylinder motor instead of a six, and uh, they've, they've really wanted to uh, get this car uh, over into Europe so more spectators could see it. Uh, but what we did, we started with a, uh, a production chassis and we installed a, a tubular roll cage structure in it and modified the wheel tubs a bit so that it could accept a larger tire and uh, replaced most of the body work with carbon fiber panels and uh, we widened the fenders about two inches per side and uh, that's about it. And now, what's that noise attracting all those people? Oh yes, one of the highlights for the Goodwood crowd was the appearance of the Hot Rods from Hell, six classic AA fuel alteds. Um, 
The cars run on nitromethane, and uh, they will burn in the course of a quarter mile about 11 gallons, 13 gallons. It depends on the car and the engine setup. Most have about 3,000 horsepower. Uh, the wheelbase is roughly 100 inches, and the center of gravity is very high. So fuel altered is kind of a, a unique thing and uh, a bit difficult sometimes. Yeah, thanks, Ron. A bit difficult probably wins the in-pit lane prize for understatement of the year. There were just so many cars at Goodwood that doing the meeting justice would take a whole series and a crew of dozens, not to mention a budget of several hundred thousand. There were rally cars, off-road cars, classic cars, bikes, wacky races and wacky people doing wacky things on the ground and in the air. It was all a touch overwhelming, really. Well, we've had an absolutely marvellous time here at Goodwood. It has been superb here at the Festival of Speed. And standing here at the, at the very spot that Lord March himself was yesterday standing amidst the rain and being, dare I say it, positively radiant. Absolutely radiant. I'm having some scones. I'm having some cream, some clotted cream, and regrettably we are saying goodbye to Goodwood and to merry old England. And quite frankly, it can't come fast enough. Uh, look, I, look, I'll be honest with you, I'm going to break character for just a moment. The Goodwood Festival of Spain is sensational. If you want to see all of the world's best cars, a lot of the world's great drivers, this is the place to come. But ultimately, it's a question of style over substance. They don't actually do anything, and it seems more for an excuse for a lot of chinless wonders to get together and uh, amuse themselves with each other's company. But apart from that, if you put all that aside, the cars are superb. The racing is, well, there's no racing as such. They drive up the, uh, up the hill at various speed, and occasionally you get people like Antonio Pizzonia or somebody who decides to do a bit of a burnout to entertain the crowd. But, uh, look, if you like your historic cars, you'll certainly see plenty of them here. I hope you've enjoyed the uh, the Festival of Speed from Goodwood. You've certainly been enjoyed it in far warmer condition, although having said that, it's absolutely lovely at the moment, although the wind's, uh, the wind's kicking up and give it five minutes, who knows what might happen. We'll see you next week for another edition of In Pit Lane. Until then, tally-ho, pip-pip and cheerio, and Lord March, wherever you are, I don't know if you can talk like shit. <laughs> <laughs>